To understand the branching factor, let me quiz you on how many states you can possibly read from any other state. And as an example, from C1, you can reach under any action choice B1, C1, and C2, but it will give you an effective branching factor of 3. So I'm going to ask you, what's the effective branching factor in B3? What is the maximum number of states you can reach under any possible action from B3? So how many states can you reach from B3 over here? And the answer is 8. If you go north, you might reach this state over here, this one over here, this one over here. If you go east, you might reach this state over here, or this one over here, or this one over here, this one over here. When you put it all together, you can reach all of those 8 states over here. There are other problems with the search paradigm. The second one is that the tree will be very deep. And the reason is, we might be able to circle forever in the area over here without reaching the gold state. And that makes for a very deep tree. And until we reach the gold state, we won't even know it's the best possible action. So conventional planning might have difficulties with basically infinite loops. The third problem is that many states reoccur in the search. In A star, we were careful to visit each state only once. But here, because the, uh, actions might carry back to the same state, C1 is, for example, over here and over here, you might find that many states in the tree might be visited many, many different times. Now, if you had a state, it doesn't really matter how you got there, yet the tree doesn't understand this, and it might expand states more than once. These are the three problems that are overcome by our policy method. And this motivates in part by calculating policies is so much better of an idea than using conventional planning in stochastic environments. So let's get back to the policy case. Let's look at the grid world again, and let me ask you a question. I wish to find a optimal policy for all these states that with maximum probability leads me to the absorbing state plus 100. And as I just discussed, I assume there's four different actions, north, south, west, and east, that succeed with probability 80% provided that the corresponding grid cell is actually attainable. I wish to know what is the optimal action in the corner state over here, A1. Let me give you four choices, north, south, west, and east. And the answer is east. East, in exploitation, transports you to the right side, and you're one closer to your goal position. Let me ask the same question for the state over here, C1. Which one is the optimal action for C1? And the answer is north, that gets you one step closer. There's two equally long paths, but over here you risk falling to the minus 100, therefore you'd rather go north. The next question is challenging. Consider state C4. Which one is the optimal action, provided that you can run around as long as you want, there's no cost associated with steps, but you wish to maximize the probability of ending up in one plus 100 over here? Think before you answer this question. And the answer is south. The reason why it's south is if we attempt to go south, the 80% probability will stay in the same cell. In fact, the 90% probability because we can't go south and we can't go east. With 10% probability, we find ourselves over here, which is a relatively safe state because we can actually go to the left side. If we were to go just west, which is the intuitive answer, then there's a 10% chance we end up in the minus 100 absorbing state. You can convince yourself you go south, find ourselves eventually in state C3, and then go west, west, north, north, east, east, east. You will never ever run risk of falling into the minus 100. And that argument is tricky. And to convince ourselves, let me ask the other hard question. So what shall we do in state B3 as the optimal action? And the answer is west. If we're over here and we go east, we likely end up at minus 100. If we go north, which seems to be the intuitive answer, there's a 10% chance we fall into the minus 100. However, if we go west, then there's absolutely no chance we fall into the minus 100. We might find ourselves over here. We might be in the same state. We might find ourselves over here. But from these states over here, there are safe policies that can safely avoid the minus 100. So even for the simple grid world, the optimal control policy, assuming stochastic actions and no cost of moving, except for the final absorbing costs, is somewhat non-trivial. Take a second to look at this. Along here, it seems pretty obvious, but for the state over here, B3, and for the state over here, C4, 
We choose an action that just avoids falling to the minus 100, which is more important than trying to make progress towards the plus 100. Now, obviously, this is not the general case of an MDP, and it's somewhat frustrating that we're willing to run to the wall just so as to avoid falling to the minus 100. And the reason why this seems unintuitive is because we're really forgetting the issue of costs. In normal life, there's a cost associated with moving. MDPs are general enough to have a cost factor. The way we're going to denote cost is by defining a reward function over any possible state. We are reaching the state A4, gives us plus 100, minus 100 for B4, and perhaps minus 3 for every other state, which reflects the fact that if we take a step somewhere, that we will pay minus 3, so this gives an incentive to shorten the final action sequence. So we're now ready to state the actual objective of an MDP, which is to minimize not just the momentary um, cost, but the sum of all future rewards. So we're going to write RT to denote the fact that this reward is received at time T. And because our reward itself is stochastic, we have to compute the expectation over those. And that we seek to maximize. So we seek to find the policy that maximizes the expression over here. Now, another interesting caveat is that sometimes people put a so-called discount factor into this equation with an exponent of t, where discount factor could for example be 0.9. And what this does is it decays future reward relative to more immediate rewards. And it's kind of a alternative way to specify costs. So we can make this explicit by a negative reward per state, or we can bring in a discount factor that discounts the plus 100 by the number of steps that it went by before it reached the plus 100. That also gives us an incentive to get to the goal as fast as possible. The nice mathematical thing about discount factor is it keeps this exploitation bounded. It's easy to show this expression over here will always be small or equal to 1 over 1 minus gamma times the absolute reward maximizing value, um, and which in this case would be plus 100. The definition of the expected sum of future possible discounted rewards that I've just given you allows me to define a value function. For each state s, my value of the state is the expected sum of future discounted reward provided that I start in state S, then I execute policy high. This expression looks really complex, but it really means something really simple, which is, suppose you start in the state over here, and you get plus 100 over here, minus 100 over here, and suppose for now, every other state costs you minus 3. For any possible policy that assigns actions to the non-absorbing states, you can now simulate the agent for quite a while and compute empirically what is the average reward that is being received until you finally hit a goal state. So, for example, for the policy that you like, the value would, of course, uh, for any state depend on how much you make progress towards the goal and whether you bounce back or forth. In fact, in the state over here, you might bounce down and have to do the loop again. Uh, but there's a well-defined expectation over any possible execution of the policy pie that is generic to each state in each policy pi. That's called a value. And value functions are absolutely essential to MDP. So the way we're going to plan is we're going to iterate and compute value functions. And it will so turn out that by doing this, we're going to find better and better policies as well. Before I dive into mathematical detail about value functions, let me just give you a situation. The value function is a potential function that leads from the goal location, in this case the 100 in the upper right, all the way into the space so that hill climbing in this potential function leads you on the shortest path to the goal. The algorithm is a recursive algorithm. It spreads value through the space, as you can see in this animation. And after a number of iterations, it converges, and you have a grayscale value that really corresponds to the best way of getting to the goal. Hill climbing in that function gets you to the goal. You can simplify it. Think about this as pouring a glass of milk uh, into the 100 state and having the milk descend through the maze. And later on, when you go in the gradient of the milk flow, you will reach the goal in the optimal possible way. So let me tell you about a truly magical algorithm called value iteration. 
In that iteration, we recursively calculate a value function so that in the end we get what's called the optimal value function, and from that we can derive, look up the optimal policy. And here's how it goes. Suppose we start with a value function of zero everywhere, except for the two absorbing states whose value is plus one and minus 100. Then we can ask ourselves the question is, for example, for the field A3, zero a good value? And the answer is, no, it isn't. It is somewhat inconsistent. We can compute a better value. In particular, we can understand that if we are in A3 and we choose to go east, then with 0.8 chance, we should expect a value of 100. With 0.1 chance, we will stay in the same state, in which case the value is minus 3. And with 0.1 chance, we go into stay down here for minus 3. So with the appropriate definition of value, we would get the following formula, which is 77. So 77 is a better estimate of value for the state over here. And now that we've done it, we can ask ourselves the question, is this a good value, or this a good value, or this a good value? And we can propagate value backwards in reverse order of action execution from the positive absorbing state through this grid world and fill every single state with a better value estimate than the one we uh, assumed initially. If we do this for the grid over here and run value iteration through convergence, then we get the following value function. We get 93 over here, we're very close to the goal, 89, 85, 81, 77, 73, 70 over here. This state will be worth 68, and this state is worth 47. And the reason why these are not so good is because we might stay quite a while in those before we're able to execute um, an action that gets us outside the state. So let me give you an algorithm that defines value iteration. We wish to estimate recursively the value of a state S. And we do this based on a possible successor state, S prime, that we look up in the existing table. Now actions A are non-deterministic, therefore we have to go through all possible S primes and weigh each outcome with the associated probability. Probability of reaching S prime given that we start in state S and apply action A. This expression is usually discounted by gamma, and we also add the reward or the costs of the state. And because there's multiple actions, and it's up to us to choose the right action, we will maximize over all possible actions. So if you look at this equation, it looks really complicated, but it's actually really simple. We compute a value recursively based on successor values, plus the reward or minus the cost it takes us to get us there. Because Mother Nature picks a successor state for us for any given action, we could put an expectation over the value of the successor state weighted by the corresponding probabilities, which is happening over here. And because we can choose our action, we maximize over all possible actions, uh, and therefore the max as opposed to the expectation on the left side over here. This is a equation that's called backup. In terminal states, we just assign Rs, and obviously in the beginning of value iteration, these expressions are different and we have to update, but as Bellman has shown a while ago, this process of updates converges. After convergence, this assignment over here is uh, replaced by the equality sign, and when this equality holds true, we have what is called uh, a Bellman equality or a Bellman equation. And that's all there is to know to compute values. If you assign this specific uh, equation over and over again to each state, eventually you get a value function that looks just like this, where the value really corresponds to what's the optimal future cost-reward trade-off that you can achieve if you act optimally in any given state over here.